Podcast. My name is Derek Peterson. Joining me this week, I'm very excited to have Hill Varsity's fearless leader, Brandon Vogel. Brandon, hello. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I just saw a picture of a uh, 14-year-old, I'm going to assume defensive lineman or offensive lineman, some recruit in the 2025 class that just came across my timeline and uh, makes me feel like I have not been in the gym ever in my entire life. <laughs> so um, I'm okay. I'm okay. This has been a hectic week, man. Um, there were a hectic last seven days or so, especially <laughs> – college football world um you love college football you take in as much college football content as you can possibly take in um when i think of people who just care about college football as a product and not necessarily somebody that's in it for like a specific recruit or specific uh rooting interests you're the first name that comes up so i've got you on the podcast today because i want to talk to you about the massive news that usc ucla are coming to the big 10 I want to get your thoughts on what this means for the Big Ten going forward. I want to get your thoughts on what this means for Nebraska going forward. Um, because it is, you know, when like stunning news happens, people kind of throw around phrases like seismic news, um, you know, stunning, groundbreaking, earth shattering, like landscape changing. This is truly one of those types of moves. Um, the, like USC is the Pac-12. USC is the Pac-10, whatever that the name for that Pacific West Coast Conference is. Like it's USC. They're synonymous with it. They're not going to be in the Pac-12 in 2024. They're moving to the Big Ten. UCLA is coming with them. A little inside baseball. This happened last week. This broke <laughs> while I was recording this podcast with Connor from Homefield, and it was funny because I got um, I got a phone call while we're recording. We've got we've got like 10 minutes left in the, in the the podcast, and I get a phone call. I decline it. I get another phone call. I decline it. I get another phone call from my brother. I'm like, what is happening right now? I decline it. I'm like, I can't talk. I'm podcasting. And all the while, like I'm trying to keep the conversation going with, with Connor. So like, if it seemed like I was distracted in the last episode, I apologize to people that were listening to that. Um, When I told Connor the news after we got done recording, I was like, Hey guys, I have to jump out of here real quick. Cause USC and UCLA are going to the big 10. The last image on my screen before I dropped out of the lobby was Connor's jaw hitting the desk in front of him and his hands going on his head. Like what? Um, crazy, crazy news. Stunning, but it didn't surprise a ton of people when you really kind of dug into sort of the, the financial element, the economic element at play here. So, um, I figure this could be a pretty free flowing discussion, Brandon. Like when you first heard that USC and UCLA, I think the phrasing was are in negotiations with the big 10 to join the conference in 2024, but nothing has been finalized. When you first saw that tweet or wherever you first saw the news, what immediately ran through your brain? Um, (laughs) I was on my last day of vacation, actually driving back while riding at the time when I saw the tweet, um, from Florida and I was trying to kind of be unplugged during that time, but I couldn't help check Twitter. I was like, Oh, that's interesting reports, USC, UCLA. I was like "Ah, a couple days, you know, something will probably happen with that. No, by the time I got back, uh, that evening, it was out there. They had, had official releases from UCLA and USC um, and got to work just writing something up quick. And then it was at that point that I kind of had to to stop and actually process it. I think my big takeaway or immediate thought was what a coup for the Big Ten. Because when OU and Texas went to, SC, went to the SEC or announced that move, I was like, well, wow, the SEC just took like – the two most valuable chips on the table and there's not much out there because I mean, I, and it never even kind of entered my mind that USC and UCLA might be out there for the big 10. Um, certainly not as that being the only move, which we have to this point. Um, I don't think that'll be the case long-term, but so great job, I guess. It's a little bit weird to, to have a conference that spans the entire country, but probably puts the big 10 in a pretty good position going forward. And I mean, it's, it's, so much of this is about building the biggest TV deal you can get. The Big Ten and the SEC were already basically neck and neck. 
uh, this only helps, obviously, the Big Ten, because not only do you get two brand schools across a lot of sports, you get L.A., um, which it, <laughs> I, we've all talked that that time period is over, too, where you're like, oh, what's the media market? I agree with that, and I think it's been over for a while. But if you've got L.A. sitting out there, uh, you might as well grab it if you can. Yeah, the um, the the countrywide conference that this creates, that was kind of the first – you know, as news breaks and sort of the news element kind of you move past the news element, then you get to you start to see columns coming through. A lot of the narrative was this kills what made college football great or what makes college football great. And that is regionalism and tradition. And so when you have a conference that stretches from the East Coast to the West Coast, you don't really have that regionalism aspect. Like the thing that defines the big 10 anymore is not like Midwestern schools in the Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois radius. Like it was a decade ago or two decades ago. Um, do I, I guess, do you, do you kind of agree with that train of thought that this move that USC sort of playing Michigan in November and playing Rutgers and things like that, like that this move somehow begins the deterioration of what makes college football great. I mean, I think it's been, I think it's been eroding for a little bit now. Um, and we all kind of, you know, I think a lot of us bemoan some of the rivalries lost, you know, Nebraska, Oklahoma being one, obviously for Nebraska fans, but, if you're a Kansas fan, that Kansas-Missouri game was a huge deal and only one of the longest running rivals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, the sport has been getting less and less regional as we've gone and we've, we've seen these conferences expand. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about this one is, is like the conferences were still largely regional. But like you said, now we've got one that spans the entire country. And, and I think the thing that will be lost, like it'll still matter when – Oklahoma plays Alabama because those are two name ba- name brand programs. They're going to play a lot now against the, each other in the SEC. I, I do worry about those early, like if we're headed to a future where there's, you know, two, maybe three conferences that matter, or maybe just two, three conferences, period. Um, what do you, like, you're going to lose that big kind of non-conference game, um, possibly. I mean, you could still play an SEC team from the Big Ten, vice versa. But it's just going to mean a little bit less because I think you get used to playing more and more teams. Um, so I, I do kind of I, I miss that part of it that that September game where it's like, oh, Oregon's going to Ohio State. I uh, don't think the Ducks are going to do much there, and then they walk into Ohio State and beat them. <laughs> We're, there's 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 just not many of those left if we continue down this path. Okay, so this you were the perfect person to talk about this because you like a game on Friday night in September the same as you do a conference championship game on Friday night in December. So if you can if you could pick between well like one of the things that has been floated is a Pac-12 ACC partnership where the conferences don't dissolve but like the winner of the Pac-12 instead of playing in a Pac-12 championship game would play the winner of the ACC in like a dual conference championship game. So let's say you could have, and and I would assume that if that scenario comes to pass, Oregon and Washington are remaining in the Pac-12. So let's just say you could have a non-conference game September 17th between Oregon and Clemson in Death Valley, or you could have a December conference championship game with a trophy on the line between Oregon and Clemson in I don't know, some big NFL stadium that's like not that doesn't have a home field element. Like which one is more appealing to you? Probably still the non-conference game because it's what I'm used to and I'm old. Um, So I'll I'll take that. I'll take that September game. Um, I mean, the idea of a Pac-12 ACC by coastal alliance is is an interesting one, you know, and most cases with those two conferences, at least in the past, you're dealing with two likely playoff teams there. Uh, so I do wonder, uh, you know, is it a situation where both of them are going to get in anyway? Isn't it an elimination game? You know, you'll have both scenarios, I think. I, I just hope they put it in the Rose Bowl and say, what do you think about that, Big Ten? That would be uh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> One thing I've been thinking about in all of this, we need uh, football-specific conference affiliations. I think 
that has to be priority number one going forward. If we're going to kind of like try to keep any semblance of the college sports model going, because I, I mean, how do you think Big Ten volleyball programs feel about the prospect of having to go to Los Angeles on like a, a school night in the middle of the season? Like, like, what do you think? Like went through John Cook's mind whenever he saw this news. Like probably, yeah, like this is great. But then you start to get into the sort of the logistics of it. They're going to have two years to kind of figure it out. But it's a long, it's a long way, you know, because Nebraska is going to get sent to Rutgers and then the next week they're going to get sent to Los Angeles. That's going to happen. Yeah. I, 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 that was one of the first handful of thoughts I had after this was like, okay, well, <laughs> there's, there's like a what, 10 or 11 schools, maybe not even that many, maybe nine that have ever won in a women's volleyball national championship. And that sport early in its history was like totally dominated by the West Coast. And then Texas and Nebraska and Penn State sort of helped move the sport eastward. Cook being a California native, uh, obviously very familiar with UCLA and USC. I'm guessing he was probably excited about that. So for Nebraska, you know, it, it, it'll be interesting from a scheduling perspective. Like who any big team that goes out there is obviously going to play them both while they're out there. Um, and I guess you try and set up something similar for, for basketball. Like being, being that geographically diverse – limit you a little bit for scheduling those things because we you know the college basketball calendar is pretty pretty regular you know you like you play wednesday and then you play sunday or you know you basically have that long of a layoff there and it's it's going to be a nightmare just to coordinate that so i agree with you like it's very clear that football is like operating in its best interests and that like everything else flows from there why does it have to flow from football? Why can't football just be like, yeah, the Big Ten in football is it has USC and UCLA, and I know it gets complicated. This isn't as simple as just saying I don't get this. But what are what are USC and UCLA going to do in basketball? Um, what are they going to do when they want to play games non conference? And you're probably going to have a hard time scheduling games with those former their former conference mates. Uh, I don't see anybody jumping at the, to, to help those two schools out after they got on the first train out of there. Mm -hmm. So it, it all becomes very, very complicated there. And for those sports that have to travel multiple times a week, it's, it's a big problem that people all note as a problem. And then like nothing really happens with it. It's just like, well, you gotta do what you gotta do. You gotta go to Rutgers if you're in Nebraska every now and again. The thing that I'm very curious to see is like, if you look at the NBA scheduling model, when they've got East coast teams that have to play crossover games against Western conference teams, you'll get like a block where you're just out on the West coast for like a month and you're not home. And I wonder if with a sport like basketball, if that becomes the big tens model for USC and UCLA, where those teams, when it's time to play like their road games, just to make it easier from a travel standpoint, from a financial standpoint, easier on, you know, student athletes bodies, like get them out there and then keep them out there for a couple of weeks and let them get in a few games. And if that's the, like, if that's the scenario you're going to use, what does that cost from like a housing standpoint? Like, are they just staying in hotels the entire time? Who's paying for that? And then from a, you know, from a, from a school standpoint, like people are like, Oh, they're going to miss class. Well, COVID kind of showed universities that they can have um, online school and it can be pretty effective. Like my wife taught an online class before COVID because it was specifically for students that couldn't make it to campus. And then COVID happened and, Oh, you realized, Oh, we can actually just introduce a zoom component into like teacher lectures and now she doesn't have that online teaching job anymore. So like schools have figured out that they, I'm sure you probably know this too with, with your wife. Um, schools have figured out that they can use Zoom and they can have online school. And so I don't think, I don't see that being an issue, but I do wonder if the student athletes are going to be like, yeah, I'm fine with a month of online school and not having interaction with teachers or classmates or anything like that. Like, I wonder what this does to the student athlete experience. It's going to be very interesting to see how the Big Ten kind of, manages that because I mean even when they added Rutgers like it wasn't it wasn't like this there were schools between I saw somebody say that the distance between Nebraska and Rutgers is the same as the distance between Nebraska and the California schools the difference is that there's 
what, 11, 12, 13 other schools between Nebraska and Rutgers or 12 yeah. other schools between Nebraska. There's no one between Nebraska and the California schools. So it'd be very, it would be very interesting to see how they kind of massage that. Yeah. I, th- I think what you laid out, laid out is right. Like, you know, cause it wouldn't make sense if you're going to send USC and UCLA basketball, well, you're going to have to, cause it's their conference in two years. Um, like, it would be the most efficient probably uh, to keep them out there for two weeks. Where do they stay? I don't know. Um, like you mentioned, is it all hotels? Like where are they practicing every day? All of those things. And then let them be back for two weeks. But you know, even with the ability to, to, to go to your courses uh, for those two weeks, you're on the road. Like what a weird college experience that would be. We'd be like, yeah, every two weeks, I'm just, I'm, I'm not here. I'm not on campus. I'm gone. Um, and I, you know, it's it's possible. I I think there's there's not much that can be done about it now, but that does feel like something that's that feels like a little bit of a loss to me. You know, if I were a person that age looking to go to college, um, I'd be excited about pieces of the the Big Ten. If if I were a UCLA, you know, basketball player, baseball player, uh, but that part of it would bother me if that ends up you know ends up being how they have to approach this. And the other problem that poses is. If you have the LA schools on a, like a two week, three week road trip, just in order to balance their schedule, they're going to play a bunch of home games consecutively. They're going to be at home a bunch. That is an advantage. That is a scheduling advantage for them. So pose that scenario to somebody like Greg Gard and say like, what do you think of this? Like, do you think that that's an advantage for them? Would you wish that like you could do that with Wisconsin? He'd probably be like, yeah, I don't really like that very much for them. That's a competitive <laughs> advantage for them. Yeah, that's that's a good point. But I would say, you know, because I've thought about this a little bit, and I hadn't thought about it in that that way. So maybe we can talk it through a little bit. Um, yeah, getting that two week home stretch is is nice. But is it harder to be on the road for two weeks? Because those teams you're playing at home, those Big Ten games, like it's okay, Ohio State and Michigan come out and they play, you know, Michigan plays UCLA, USC plays Ohio State. Two nights later, they just flip flop. So Michigan and Ohio State are out there for four days and then they get to go back home. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, yeah. it, it's easier for a Big Ten team to just kind of like pop out there and be like, well, we got to go do our California thing. Yep. Um, and, and I think about this with, with football too. Um, I think it gets interesting because in the NFL, it's pretty well established that teams going east tend to underperform to against the point spread. Um, and there's only four teams. And, you know, the sample sizes with this are always pretty small. But do you think about that for USC and UCLA? I think about Lincoln Riley specifically. You know, I have a feeling he's going to get – USC up and running pretty quickly. Uh, I would be surprised. It, I mean, it might even happen this year. I think they've got a good schedule to to kind of get off to a really, really fast start. Um, so maybe by next year, they're going into the season ranked in the top 10. Seems feasible. Then you got to go to that. Yeah, then you got to switch to the Big Ten. And I mean, you wrote about this specifically in one of our one of our yearbooks. You know, having watched that firsthand, all of it, it was basically when I started on the Nebraska beat watching Nebraska's transition to the Big Ten, like there are some things that are just different. So USC and UCLA are going to get paid big time. It was a smart move for their individual security in the future, but there are competition pieces of this that I think are uniquely challenging for those schools that are the most remote. Yeah, and that that, um, Big Ten 10 years later piece that I wrote for the yearbook, that was where my brain immediately went. Cause I was thinking about some of the quotes that were in there um, where somebody told me that I can't remember who it was, but somebody told me like take Wisconsin and put them in the big 12 and they're probably going to be okay, but there are going to be some matchups that they struggle with. That's what's going to happen with USC. I think like it seems more likely to me than not that Lincoln Riley's offense will be closer to Ohio state than it will be to, I don't know, like Purdue um, but also like it, there's going to be some matchups that are going to take time for them, um, specifically at the line of scrimmage. But this is definitely one of those situations where it was fire first, aim second. Yeah. And it was such because the reporting that has come out after the fact is that USC and UCLA as full members of the Big Ten 
could get a hundred million dollar a year payouts from the Big Ten's next media rights deal. Yep. So every team would be getting a hundred million dollars a year. That's a lot of money. Yep. That is going to help Nebraska a ton. Yeah. I, I, I think so. I you know, I look at this, you, you mentioned off the top, you know, what does this mean for Nebraska? And from a football perspective, you know, it doesn't make things any easier for them, certainly, um, because USC, I think you can realistically expect them to come in at a spot higher than whatever Nebraska is able to get to over the past two years or the next two years. And we know where they're at now. <laughs> it's nowhere near they want to be, near where they want to be in the conference pecking order. Um, UCLA, who knows, you could maybe put them equivalent with Nebraska. So if you look at this from a perspective of, okay, Nebraska's got to jump X number of teams, however number of teams you think that is. But certainly, you know, Ohio State's at the top, and then you've got Penn State, Michigan, Iowa, Wisconsin. Um, a lot of teams Nebraska hasn't beaten in a while, sort of in there in the middle, you know, the Minnesotas, the Purdue's. Uh, Northwestern, et cetera. Like Nebraska is in that group right now in terms of their football performance over the past five, six years. Uh, where do USC and UCLA slot in two years from now? Uh, it's just, you know, it, for a program like Nebraska that's trying to get back there, you just got two new hills to climb, I think. Um, one of them may be really steep. Uh, one of them may, may not be that steep or may not be there at all. But I, that's that's kind of my approach to how I view this from Nebraska's perspective in terms of what it means for their football program starting in two years. For the on-field component, I agree with you. But from all of the stuff that helps the on-field component, I feel like Nebraska did really well here. Because, so here's a, here's a question for you. If Nebraska had been getting a hundred million dollars a year right now in its media rights payouts instead of like sixty or whatever it was, do you think that Trev Alberts would have been as financially health conscious with Scott Frost's buyout as he was? No, probably not. Um, and you know, we we have to remember that, and I forget the exact year that they finally became fully vested in the Big Ten. But Nebraska has always been a pretty fiscally responsible athletics program, and that's what allowed it to say, "Okay, we're going to come into the Big Ten and get basically a partial share for X number of years." It was six, seven, eight years, something like six, that. Six years and six years. Yeah, six years. Okay, um, and then okay, now you're fully, you're getting a full payout now. Um, so that's good, but you still sacrificed a good amount of, of potential revenue, well, actual revenue, uh, for that six year span. So I think something like this, it does, it not only gives you more flexibility to, to be, to worry less about buyouts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it also kind of ups the incentive to, to be really, really aggressive. Yeah, definitely. Um, you, I mean, it, it, when, when that kind of money is on the table, and you are a, a program like Nebraska that has really been pretty, like you said, fiscally conservative, pretty health conscious with its finances. Um, they're certainly doing much better than UCLA is. I don't know if you saw the reports about UCLA potentially having to cut sports. Um, Nebraska has managed things well, and that has particularly been the case under Trove Alberts. Um, if you're getting this influx of cash, you know, you can be in a situation where you don't necessarily have to worry about a buyout if your coach is underperforming, where you can say, you know what, it's not good enough. We are getting a coach in here who's going to win. It also puts you in a position where you can be um, as competitive with whoever you want when it comes to assistant coach salary pools, puts you in a position where you can, you know, you can green light facility projects like the one Nebraska is currently undergoing and not feel any kind of stress over it. It puts you in a position where you can invest more resources into your recruiting department, more resources into some of your athletic support departments and things like that. Um, and I would imagine, I don't, I, I would imagine that like the windfall of this is going to like find a way to filter into like ancillary pieces with the football program. So I'm thinking, like, what does this do from an NIL standpoint for Nebraska? How does this help better position them from an NIL standpoint? The other thing that I, it's going to do, and people made the joke about Calabrasca kind of cropping back up again, 
But like, as much as being the only West Coast teams in the Big Ten helps USC recruit California, which is a narrative that I've seen, California is now open to the Big Ten, more so than it has been. And Nebraska, I know it was a different staff, but Nebraska has done well in California. And now those California recruits, it doesn't, it doesn't just have to be Ohio State. It doesn't just have to be USC. They could go to a school like Michigan. They could go to a school like Nebraska if they, if they gel with the coaching staff, if they gel with the, the university. Because we've seen time and time and time again, elite prospects get out here and they're like, oh, this is actually pretty cool. I didn't know that this is what it's like. So like from, from that standpoint, like I've, there are a lot of pluses here for Nebraska. <laughs> Yeah, the recruiting one's interesting. Um, we, we talk in Nebraska circles a lot about Texas and what was lost by leaving the Big 12, whether that was closed to Nebraska by nature, it was closed to Nebraska via strategy. I think it was some sort of combination of both of those. But since 1973, um, which I you know, have tracked players signed, scholarship players, not including walk-ons, uh, players signed by state. Um, so that was Tom Osborne's first year as head coach. California and Texas over that span are virtually identical. I think Texas ha- has like a two-player lead over California during that time. And pre-Big 12, so all of the big eight years from 73 to 1995, uh, Nebraska signed about two and a half Texans in every class and two and a half Californians in every class. So I do wonder, it was one of those things I thought about too. So, you know, there was a history of that. It goes back way before Mike Riley. It was really, really concentrated under Mike Riley because that's where their connections were. But I do wonder if, if that opens that up a little bit more for, for Nebraska, a program that is, has never really, it's never been totally absent from California. In fact, during various periods, it's relied on it pretty heavily. And I think you're, you're right. I do think it's a, a boost for USC and UCLA and might help them keep some players home, which was a big topic before this move was announced because California, you know, it was really rare to see a Clemson uh, an Alabama an Ohio state, even in California, as much as they have been in the recent past, now you can offer them, well, you're going to play in the Big Ten. You're going to go to the big house, and you know, you're going to play at Ohio State, and those schools are going to come here. I do think it's a different pitch. And I think that that's also why you've seen folks like John Wilner at the Mercury News who have said it's not a given that USC would, would be okay with Oregon joining the Big Ten because like, they've gone up against each other for recruiting battles quite a bit in recent years, and Oregon has, has – had quite a bit of success recruiting elite talent from California. And now, you know, if you're, if you're looking at those two programs and you think like, okay, program prestige is similar. I mean, not similar from like historically, but for a 20, 18 year old, 17 year old that's looking at it and saying, Oregon's been super cool my entire life. um, Those are pretty similar. Like NIL potential is pretty similar. Um, I'm staying relatively close to home. If you're a West coast kid, one, you get to play in the big 10 one, you're like, I'm playing in conference X. I don't know what that conference is going to be moving forward. Um, That'll help. So, you know, it'll be, um, I I feel like, I feel like Nebraska can do well, specifically if this staff that's in place now remains past this season. Like, I think that this staff can do well because a lot of what you see coming out of California in terms of elite prospects are at the skill positions. Yeah, they really are. And I, you know, I would have to go back and look more specifically at it, but like the, the Californians that I remember, you know, as Huskers that tended to be skill position players. Um, and I don't think that comes as a surprise. Um, but I do have a question for you. I don't know if you buy into to Wilner's line of thinking there that, you know, USC and UCLA might have an interest in blocking say in Oregon, but since you track traffic in PAC 12 circles currently, who are the two schools you think that are most likely could get into the Big Ten? Because I just have a hard time thinking that there's going to be a long period where it's just USC and UCLA out there on an island in the Big Ten. But I also don't see any super easy no-brainer options for adding another team or two from that league. 
the more I have like sat and thought about this, I think Stanford is the most likely of the three kind of most mentioned Pac-12 schools remaining. And then I and I think and and Wilner got a lot of crap from Oregon fans for saying this, but he he ranked it Stanford, Washington, Oregon. Stanford because of Stanford's going to be very, very appealing to Big Ten presidents. And that's yeah. that's the big one. Washington, from the standpoint of they're, they're an AAU member as well, but they have that Seattle television market. And then Oregon. Oregon, you know, it doesn't have... It doesn't have a TV market that execs are going to look at, even though a bunch of people watch their games. A bunch of people watch their games. I think they led the Pac-12 in TV viewership last year. Um, and it doesn't have like... A, it's not a blue blood like USC. Yeah. I kind of feel like if if the Big Ten is going with Notre Dame and has you know all its eggs in the Notre Dame basket, and then it wants to find one team to kind of partner with Notre Dame, like kind of feels like Stanford is is a it makes a a lot of sense. And I think when you get past the well, Stanford was four and eight in football last year or whatever it was, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> It, it does make a lot of sense. The only question I have then, if if Stanford is that, and I could definitely see the Big Ten making that play because while you know we've talked about it's it's all about football first, like they obviously the prestige of Stanford is something the Big Ten would be super interested in, and they're probably one of the best athletic programs in all sports. Yeah. Um, you know, which so, is something the Big Ten cares about. It's something the Big yeah. Ten prides itself on is that it's not just a football specific conference, and I think that can't get lost in this. So if that if that, if Stanford's in on that merit, why not Cal then? Because I I don't think enough people are convinced that Cal actually cares about its football program and is willing to invest in its athletic department. Yeah, well, would they be willing to invest? They're making a hundred million dollars a year. The other thing is when you start adding more teams, like they have to bring value at X number of dollars. Otherwise the payout for everybody else starts dropping. Yeah. And like, if you're adding Stanford and Cal, you have to kind of make the, the value assessment. Are they hitting that break even point where we're not cutting into revenue that we're distributing to schools? And like, Maybe the Bay Area market is enough to do that because yeah. that, I mean, I think that's a top 10 TV market as well. But I don't know if Cal does that. And if the, it, you know, I could totally see a scenario where they make the assessment that Cal doesn't do that. And so the the conclusion is, well, we can't add either of them. <laughs> Yeah, you do. You probably need some assurances. I could also see the Big Ten if it were if we're talking about that tandem in particular. I could also see a scenario where the Big Ten um, enjoyed because a, a lot of talk I've seen has been about well, is this the end of football for Stanford and Cal? Should they have dropped it a long time ago? More so Cal than Stanford, which I think is kind of the difference we're talking through here. Um, I could see the Big Ten being pretty uh, interested in in riding in, being the white knight that saved football at two prestigious academic institutions such as Stanford and California. They usually go for that stuff. I, the, the easiest one and the one that I'm personally most interested in that will never happen is I would like them to just break off the two Arizona schools um, because I, I want Arizona State in uh, in the Big Ten. I want Big Ten Media Days at Lake Havasu. okay what a great time that would be (laughs) that would be uh that'd be something um i was having a conversation with an acc person about what happens with duke if the acc starts to to splinter um and we were talking about like what if the big 12 because the big 12 is is reportedly targeting the two arizona schools utah and colorado from the pac-12 and to get arizona into a conference that also has Kansas from a basketball standpoint as a slam dunk. And I was like, could they then like, like let's say Duke gets kind of left in the, the line as they're choosing teams as the captains are choosing teams on the playground um, because they have a doormat football program. And I was like, what happens if the big 12 is like, yeah, we'll take Duke. Absolutely. And now you've got Duke, Kansas and 
and Arizona and you have unquestionably the best basketball conference in the country. And we're like, well, is the big 12 currently the best basketball conference in the country or is the big 10, the best basketball conference in the country? You're getting UCLA. If you had Arizona, you know, you are the best basketball yeah. conference in the country. If you had Stanford, from a women's basketball standpoint, Stanford is a powerhouse. Um, what do you think of like another, like Iowa State has long been mentioned as a Big Ten school, Kansas, Kansas State, some of the schools in like the Big 12 footprint. Do you think that the Big Ten goes after any of those? Or do you think the Big Ten is wholly interested on Notre Dame and then, I don't know, maybe trying to steal like North Carolina and Duke or something from the ACC? Yeah, um, I unfortunately for uh, Kansas, Iowa State at all, like I thought maybe there was a window there where it seemed like the Big Ten probably needed to expand somewhere um, to to kind of keep up with the SEC. And obviously, Iowa State and Kansas kind of didn't check the boxes that OU and Texas did. Um, and I wasn't even thinking West Coast. Now that they've got USC and UCLA, I think it makes it even less likely that a Kansas is going to get in basically on his basketball merit. Um, the last, the, the place the big 10 is not now um, in the country is the South. So, and, you know, we know during uh, the Rutgers Maryland, so 2014, that expansion, there were some rumors that Georgia tech was, was pretty close. Virginia was pretty close to again, really good academic institutions that of course the big 10 is going to have interested in interest in. I mean, I think if you can get North Carolina, um, any, any conference would be, would be happy to, to take them. I think the South is where the, the, the big 10 has to go. And that basically leaves the ACC. Can I float an idea to you? Yes. What if the big, if, college football at the FPS level just flowed into two conferences. The Big Ten has the North. Everything up. The SEC has the South. And then within those two leagues, you divide into divisions. Say divisions. Two conferences, you divide into divisions. And you've got like 10 to 12 teams in each division. Would that be a, a, a sustainable model? I think so. Um, it would you, <laughs> it would basically operate like a professional league, um, which like uh, I, I don't want to just be like, I'm cool with that. Like, it's fine without thinking more through it. Um, but it seems like where things are headed anyway. I, I, I'm intrigued by that idea. I'm specifically intrigued because since you came up with it, your name can go first. Um, but you and I will go on a Mason Dixon like journey across the country to determine where the sec starts and where the big 10 ends. Yeah. Uh, and it'll be the Peterson Vogel line, uh, yeah. will be written about for centuries. Very excited. Love it. Love it. Chart, chart the trip. Um, the last thing that I want to ask you about: How do, do you think this this is uh, spells danger for the NCAA basketball tournament? Because if you're starting to consolidate conferences and you don't have football specific affiliations anymore, or not anymore, but if if you don't have football specific affiliations and you start consolidating conferences, what does this do to the the NCAA basketball tournament? Anything? I don't think so because it's it basically prints money now it it becomes interesting because I mean we, we talk about this future where we get to basically maybe there's only two conferences left for for football like or let's just like break FBS FBS football off which isn't that hard because it basically already is they play by the NCAA's rule book but that's about it um like part of the problem with all of these conferences reshuffling and getting as big as they can to keep up and do all of this stuff is like even if you like football okay it's broken off it's basically two divisions like you were talking about an idea like that uh and you just want to go back to the way things were for the ncaa basketball tournament which is also awesome like you kind of can't at that point so it's it's one of those things where there's there's kind of a hard out on that i think um 
if we're going to do this thing where if, if we, if we're going to go where everybody thinks we're going with, with major college football, like let's just get there. Um, but I don't know how we can, because all of these conferences operate as basically their own independent businesses and operate in their, their own interests, which they have to do at this point. Greg Sankey for college football czar. That's what we need. Need somebody. We do. We need somebody. Bob Stoops. There you go. How about Bob Stoops? Or could be. or when John Cook is done winning national <laughs> titles at Nebraska, John Cook as college football czar. He has good college football ideas. <laughs> that would go over very well in Nebraska. I'm trying to imagine like the rest of the country, like this is all kept under wraps. Be like, we're going to introduce the new president of college football. It's uh, Nebraska's volleyball coach. Let's go live <laughs> to Nick. Let's go live to Nick Saban. Get his reaction. <laughs> it'd be uh, it'd be credible. I mean, you know, the uh, the previous commissioner of the Pac-12 uh, had never been associated with football before being the commissioner of the Pac-12. I think he was the women's tennis championship or organization. Yeah. So there's some precedent there. Yeah, and I mean, you can't argue with 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 where the Pac-12's at now. This is true. He did a remarkable job leading that conference for a decade or so or whatever it was. Um, The vision of that man to think that we needed our own television network that we were going to operate and wholly own and then not distribute to any major uh, cable networks. It's remarkable. Where I am, I can get get the Pac-12 network one way. That's it. I had to sign up for Sling. Okay. It was the only option. Sling TV yeah. was all I had. And I do not like Sling TV's interface. It is not good. <laughs> so YouTube TV, if you want to sponsor this podcast, I will give you uh, some plugs because YouTube TV <laughs> is better than than Sling TV. Sorry to say. Brandon, you probably have some work to do, so I'll let you get out of here. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. We'll be back next week with another one. In the meantime, keep reading HailVarsity.com. Make sure you are subscribed. Go to hillvarsity.com backslash subscribe. Use the coupon code varsity at checkout. You can read everything that way and make sure that you get the magazine going forward. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Brandon for being on. Thank you to Cam for producing. We'll be back next week. Bye.